Hello and welcome again to another edition of Homeschooling Helps with Andrea Schwartz. That's me. And I'm Nancy Wilk. Okay. Usually I interrupt her and I tried really hard today not to, so good for me. All right, Nancy, what commandment are we on this week? Okay, today we are on the Eighth Commandment. And when I sh demonstrate this to my grandchildren, I show um, four and four, four little fingers that, that are kind of sneaking up things that are not that don't belong to them. So we say don't steal. We don't take things that don't belong to us. That's a pretty simple, straightforward commandment. I think we all know what it means. We're not stealing anything. Uh, you know, we don't steal anything really, you know, I mean, um, I used to, I used to kind of have the bad habit of back in the day when you would write checks, um, and you'd have to borrow a pen to write a check to leave with that pen. So that's probably the worst stealing I've ever done. I think I would say, is that all, is that what You're stealing pretty is? generous to yourself? <laughs> I, I, I think that's why we, we need to go into this a little more because too many of us, it's a short commandment. Thou shalt not steal. Check off the box. Okay, I don't do that. But if we don't look at the dimensions, first of all, let's take a look at the fact that this commandment is stated in the negative. Don't steal. So you better be sure that you're not stealing because you're told not to do so. Mm -hmm. Now, in scripture, when somebody's property is destroyed or taken or whatever, the process is not that we send them to prison, right? The Bible knows nothing about prisons. The Bible okay. knows a couple of things. If there's an offense like murder or rape or adultery, things like that, and someone commits it, the penalty according to God's word is that person forfeits his life. But not every offense is a capital offense. The reason they're called capital offenses, the capital your head was gone. So that's why they call it capital offenses. Okay. Okay. But if you take something that doesn't belong to you, if you destroy something or um, ruin something, then the Bible knows about restitution. And so what you need to do is whatever the value of that thing was and the particular circumstances, and we won't go into it here, the restitution is either twofold, threefold, fourfold, or fivefold. So in other words, built into God's law is the incentive not to do things that you're not supposed to do. And that's one of the tragic points or parts of our society today. We have eliminated God's sanctions against violations of his law and so what do you get more of? You get more violations of his law. And we have a growing prison population, some people who are there legitimately, some people who aren't there legitimately. In any case, when you don't do things the way God says to do it, not only is there personal consequences, but there's societal consequences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One thing I, I think that is, um, is sort of a, a main may not be um, in the front of someone's mind that this idea of stealing someone else's property has in there that some things do not belong to us. So it's from this commandment that we get the whole concept of personal property. This belongs, you know, this is my given to me to steward. Those things are given to you to steward or we've earned them or bought them or traded them or, or whatever. But, um, so that's a that's an important, um, you know, sort of foundational thing that we get from the this commandment that is often overlooked, I think. And um, and when we begin to expand it out and look at it in its other um, other other contexts. And, right. And it's so what we're talking about is ownership. In other words, if you can't steal, that implies that somebody owns something, that something isn't yours. Right? right. And so for children, since we're, we're putting this in the context of the home, don't take money out of my purse. Um, don't go into the refrigerator unless I give you permission because you just might have eaten dinner <laughs> and I was saving that for dinner and you go ahead and do that. But it's much more um, involved than that because stealing implies that there are things that 
rightfully belong to individuals, to families, et cetera. So let's take one very basic one. Let's talk okay. about our wealth and our resources, right? Okay. Money, when, houses, stuff like again? that, right? Money, houses, vehicles, yeah. whatever. Exactly. Let's make it easy. Let's make it a savings account. Well, okay. when you have an inflationary economy where your money buys less this year than it did last year because your government keeps printing money, your savings account is dwindling even though it may have the same number listed in it. So if you had $5,000 and you don't touch it, a year goes by and now that $5,000 doesn't buy as much this year as it did last year. And part of that has to do with the fact that we live in a debt economy and people are used to, well, if I can't afford it now, I'll go ahead and borrow it. Now, built into the whole idea of not stealing is to be responsible with those things that God gives you. Mm -hmm. And so if you put yourself in debt, and then by extension, put your community in debt and put your state in debt and put your country in debt. Really what you're doing is you're stealing the future from the people who have to pay that debt. And Dr. Rush Dooney, who um, wrote this book called Larceny in the Heart, points out the fact that that's part of our fallen nature we want things that we haven't earned. We want things that don't belong to us. And so we actually are not unwilling to find ways to take them. Mm. Okay. So our debt, our lifestyle of debt is, um, is demonstrative of our neglecting God's law not to steal. Right. The, this reminds me of a scripture in um, Ephesians and um, in Ephesians four is talking about putting off the old man. And he says, let him who stole steal no more. This is um, Ephesians four twenty eight. But let him labor working with his hands so that um, working with his hands, what's good so that he may have something to give to those who are in need. So when God is really teaching us about the stuff, it's not just just that we don't steal, but that that we put off that old that old sin and turn to be productive and working and not continuing in in that debt in that stolen um, um, the stuff that doesn't belong to us and letting somebody else pay our way, right. But we have a mindset that today anyway says it isn't so much of how much money I have or how much wealth I have in real resources. It's how much I can borrow. So people look at their ability um, and what a good citizen they are. If their credit limit is $50,000, but they may have no money in the bank. And so right. if they can't go ahead and meet their obligations, well, then we have the fancy little credit card, which really is spending money you don't have. Unless, of course, you use the credit card and at the end of every month, you go ahead and you pay that off. Well, if people are debt living and are stealing from the future, they're stealing from their children. And right. it's very difficult to instill a sense of financial and, and real responsibility if you're not living that way yourself. And so your children will get the idea, I can't wait till I'm older and then I can get whatever freebie the government offers, or, um, you know, I'll be able to get my own credit cards and be able to borrow lots of money. Mm -hmm. Right. So in you're building in a rationale that says, this is the way we do things. Right. But let's go beyond resources and property and wealth. If you turn your children over to educators who will not tell them the truth, you're stealing the past from them and you're stealing the future from them because they're not getting the truth. So right. any child who grows up thinking that he evolved from apes and that he's not a unique individual made in the image and likeness of God has had history stolen from him. 
Mm -hmm. If a child is taught that any sexual expression is okay, or a child is taught, you know what, um, you may think you're a boy, but if you feel like a girl, you can be a girl, you're stealing that person's identity by allowing it. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots and of their family. Yeah, absolutely. And their family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. But there are other ways you can steal. You can steal people's time. You can steal people's efforts. Um, this was a big one in my homeschool. At first, when I started, I sort of, without knowing it, was captive to my children. Academics was the most important thing. And if they were acting up or they weren't doing what they were supposed to do, then I spent a lot of time trying to conjole them into it because, you see, the most important thing was that we get through our schoolwork. Until I yeah. realized they were wasting my time they were wasting their time and they were wasting my efforts. Mm -hmm. Well, because my children had relatives who were very generous at Christmas and birthdays, they had money. And so one day I had the idea that, okay, let's figure out what my time would be worth as a tutor, as you know, let's not even call me a teacher, just call me a tutor. Mm -hmm. Well, I looked at what, piano lessons cost, what golf lessons cost, what all sorts of other instruction costs. And I told my son, he was the first one who experienced this. I'm worth about, I'm going to be generous with you, $40 an hour. You now owe me $40. And he was like, what? That's my money. I said, I know it is, but this is my time and my effort. And you just wasted it. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that. Right. Sometimes we put more value on a little green piece of paper than we do our time, our information, our, um, our purpose and value right. in, in God's terms. Right. Another way that um, people can steal from the family and from other people is to not take care of other people's property. So you borrow something. Can I borrow your car? Sure you're in a parking lot and it gets smashed and you go, well, it really wasn't my fault because this could have happened to you anywhere. In other words, we take things or we use things and we have no conscience of the fact that we may have to make up for damages done. And so we need to instill in our families this idea of ownership, that you live in our house, you're not allowed to abuse the property in the house because it costs something. And right. you don't have the resources to go ahead and and replace it. So in essence, if you don't take care of our stuff and you don't take care of the stuff we give you, you're stealing. Right. I was actually reading a, uh, an article the other day about um, stealing in the um, healthcare industry. A doctor observed in his, in his different examination rooms, three people from the same family. Only one of them was, uh, was sick enough to really be there. The other two were just getting checked out because they're, they were covered under the um, uh, federal um, Medicaid or Mer Medicare, or whatever. And um, so they were there and the deciding party thought that they should just get them checked out since the Medicaid would cover it. And the doctor you know, it was like, these kids weren't sick. They're taking his time. They're taking that Medicaid money inappropriately. And we don't even realize how easily it is to steal and, and, and just be oblivious to it. Right. One of the ways you can instill it in children is when they want something or use something, and you say, okay, well, then use your own resources. Well, well, no, I don't want to use my money. I want to use your money. Well, then you must not really want it. Right. In other words, and this is true for adults as well. If there's a service you're receiving and you haven't legitimately paid for it, but you're doing it because you can, then this is that larceny in your heart. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's take healthcare, for example. Oh, affordable sure. healthcare. Everybody has healthcare. Does that encourage people to be irresponsible with their health or more responsible for their health? Yeah. It, in the example we just cited, it encouraged them to be less responsible because it's like the insurance is going to pay for it. And yet, on the other hand, I've also seen people refuse to do things 
that would have helped them um, because insurance didn't pay for it. You know, if it was going to come out of their pocket, they didn't want to do it, even though it would have been good for their health. Yes. So that's the idea of instilling in yourself first and foremost, because you're never going to teach anything you don't believe, but instilling mm -hmm. in yourself the idea that there's such thing as responsible ownership. And there are certain things that belong to you or belong to someone else. And it's not that you can't share or you can't be charitable, but if you don't have the basis of the law, then charity can turn into someone taking advantage of you or you taking advantage of someone else. So ownership actually goes beyond this particular commandment. And we can see application in relationships. For example, when children are encouraged by other adults not to obey their parents, not to go along with what their parents want, we would call that alienation of affection. They're stealing from that family the relationships and loyalty that are due that family. But it happens all the time. You yes. send people to the state. Girls can get abortions in public schools without their parents' permission. Uh, apparently nowadays in, in state run schools, um, a child can decide that mom and dad think I'm a boy because that's how it was when I was born. But now when I go to school, if I tell everybody that I'm a girl or something different, they'll acknowledge it. So that's theft from the family. But unfortunately, too many parents are willingly giving their children over for the very reason that you said it's free. Right. If I had to homeschool or I had to send them to a private Christian school, that would cost money. Now, if somebody wants to give it to me for free, I'll take it. And this is where the whole concept of value comes in. What do we value? And is it what God says we should value? Right, right. A while back, we did a conversation about how important it is to have um, good support. I can see and, and know there's lots of um, young young people who maybe have an interest in a, in a young man or a young lady and the parents might, might not agree with that um, relationship moving forward. But how many families and friends would say, Oh, you deserve to be happy. It's okay. Go ahead. You know, it's not your parents' marriage. It's your marriage. You get to do what makes you happy. And so we see that's another um, stealing and um, alienating that affection. And, and when we're not everybody in um, looking at the same law and um, then we have these kind of social um, disconnects and problems that, and we don't understand why they perpetuate themselves. It's because we're not observing God's law to start with among our, of ourself and then between each other. Right. You think about when the 10 commandments were given and to whom they were given. They were given to families. They were mm -hmm. given to tribes. The context was the institution of the family. There was no official church or state until God instituted it with the Levites and with the priests, etc. But when we look at it, most of what happens in our society today is due to the breakdown of the biblical family. Not the breakdown of the secularized family, but the breakdown of the biblical family. And so why should it be a surprise that people who have been stealing from other people, because you think of all the people who don't have children in public school and their tax dollars are going for that, right? They don't have children in school. Well, people say you had children in school, but let's say you never had children in school, right? So we're so used to spreading out the things we want and letting other people pay for it, that it just becomes natural to people. So find out what, how you can get yours and then go for it. Right. All right. Yeah. So, um, so we've talked about how um, we've stealing in relationships and time and with the government, let's talk about some really um, real simple things that we can teach to the children. Um, one of the things I, I'm thinking about is at our house, one of the things that we, we don't let um, 
other kids um, inter, uh, destroy other people's work, you know? So if somebody's stacking blocks and little sister comes over and knocks them over, she, she stole her brother's work because it wasn't her, her, hers to, to destroy. So what are some other examples like that, that we might be able to, to teach even the little, little kids about personal property, personal responsibility, and not, and not stealing? Well, first of all, let me say, some people would say that is so extreme. Children cannot understand things like that. You're really being oppressive to them. Well, what's one of the first things after the word no that most <laughs> children learn? Mine. 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 Right. So everybody comes out of the shoot somewhat knowing things about ownership, even if it's they decide they own everything. Right. But uh, an another example, I would have children that would tell someone out, you get out of my room, you get out of my room. And I'd have to inform them. You don't own that room. We don't lease it to you because you don't pay for it, but we let you use that room. So mm -hmm. it's not your room in the sense that you own it. It's your room in the sense that you're responsible for it. And that's where you sleep. Thus, you have to keep it clean. And we do have doors and we have to recognize that you don't just barge in on someone so that we're going to have basic politeness that somebody's going to knock before they come in and be given OK to come in. You know, mm -hmm. well, for those who had to share a room, then they had to learn how to respect each other's boundaries in that room. So there's more than you can imagine in terms of application. When I said you don't go into the refrigerator and you see a pie and you decide it's yours. Right. Well, it might have been having to, depending on the size of the family, divided into three, four, five, six, seven, or eight. And so giving people a sense of work translates into things and that you respect people's work. Another area where I think a lot of parents go off base is enforcing sharing. Yeah. We're just making everybody good little socialists. So if somebody mm -hmm. comes to my house and, and, and now wants to play with my doll, but I like that doll special and I don't want anybody to play with that doll. And then the, the command is, well, you share, just go share. I, I did that once with my older daughter. The younger daughter wanted to play with the doll that the older daughter liked, and it was a porcelain doll. And I said, don't worry, she won't do anything about it, which point the younger daughter took the doll, smashed it on the linoleum floor, and broke the doll. Mm. Right? Yeah. I couldn't repay that because it was something that my mother-in-law had given my you know, daughter, so it was not replaceable. I'll just get you another doll. But I got to see firsthand now, what I did was I stole from my daughter because I didn't respect the fact that that really was hers and that we don't have to share. And of course, why I wanted her to share was the little one was making a lot of noise and I go, let's appease her. Right. right. So a lot of people enforce sharing because they don't want the trouble of correcting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that brings up an important point. There are some things that, that we really are not supposed to share at all. I mean, we, I, I don't share, I don't share my husband, you know, in, in way, in, in there's ways that I don't share my husband, you know, there's ways that we wouldn't share our babies, you know, like that baby's mine to take care of. I'm not going to leave her out in the street and hope somebody else picks her up and likes her, you know? So if that's your baby, you know, your, your, your doll, then yes, you're not going, if we are teaching responsible stewardship, then there are some folks that you may not want to let hold your baby doll. Exactly. And contrary to a very, very popular woman that it takes a village to raise a child, that's not what God says. God says it takes a family to raise a child. And the problem with the village mentality has to do with the fact that in and of itself, it's a usurpation of the family. So that concept, the concept of compulsory education, the concept of everybody pays for everybody else's health care, even, and I live in California and there have been devastating fires all up and down the state, we have grown to think that the government's going to go in and handle it. 
Well, if you look at it from that point of view, you're giving the federal state government a lot of power. And this is how the family has been decapitalized because it didn't recognize what was theirs. Mm -hmm. And it may sound awfully cruel to say, well, tax dollars shouldn't be spent to rebuild communities. Mm -hmm. But let's put it this way. If we eliminate the possibility that God has something to do with fires, floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes, which of course he does. Mm -hmm. And these are things which may be designed to get people's attention, to cause them to repent. If we turn to the state and say the state is the one that has to come in and fix this, who are we relying on? Who then is the God of our culture? Right, indeed. Uh, the answer is the state. In that case, we would be looking to the state uh, to be God and to fix it and to make the restitution. And instead of recognizing that fire or flood uh, from from God and our appropriate response to him. Right. And if you um, fail to understand that God in the second commandment identifies himself as a jealous God. Now it's important to differentiate. He doesn't call himself an envious God. He calls himself a jealous God. And the difference between jealousy and envy is that jealousy is correct response to something that's yours being taken away. Envy is wanting what other people have and going through illegal means to go ahead and get it and or unlawful means. And we'll get to that, believe it or not, just two commandments down the road in terms of coveting. But when we give our allegiance and worship and our dependency to the state, guess who we're stealing from? We're stealing from God. Exactly. Exactly. Right. We're stealing from God. And when he, we fail to recognize that when he is sovereign as God, our creator called us to be his own and has given us his word so that we know what is pleasing to him and we know what is contrary so that that we know um the, the way that we should go and we deny it we cannot be surprised at, at the consequences he promises us promises us that the wages of sin is death that's why it's so important for us to understand these the the law of god and to be able to to um, apply it appropriately. Otherwise we are suffering consequences that, and, and we don't know why the scripture right. says we cannot scoop fire into our, our, our breast and not be, be burned, you know? And so there's lots of ways that we do this consciously or unconsciously, but the way to, to know is to come to look to God's word and let him tell us. Otherwise, we're just guessing and making it up as we go along. Right. So in answer to the question that those who don't bow the knee to Jesus Christ love to ask is how could a good God allow all these terrible things to happen? Mm. And the answer is because he keeps his promise. Mm. He tells us many times over that he visits iniquity unto the third and fourth generations of those that hate him, but shows mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. So it's not like we haven't been told. And you might say, well, a lot of people haven't heard that. Well, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who don't hear it in the church. I dare say, if you want to do a great experiment, and you're talking to somebody who says he or she is a believer, ask that person to tell you what the 10 commandments are and even give them a pass if they mix up the order. Okay. If they get all 10, then fine. But I dare say you'll find people who know a lot of facts about a lot of things, but don't know the clear statement of these 10 commandments. Right, right, right. And there's others who would say, well, I love Jesus. He's forgiven me of my sins. And so we're good. But 
But Jesus said that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The psalmist said the law of God is a light to our path and that we love it. So as believers, we should know God's law and we should honor God as our lawgiver and not neglect his precious words to us. They are life for us. Right. And, and that's just not a nice, you know, hallmark kind of saying. It, you know, if every hair of our head is numbered and if we don't take a breath with God not granting us that breath, then we should have a healthy fear of God. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, and I say this unfortunately, because many people go around thinking, I love Jesus and that's enough. Well, they have a faulty definition, as you pointed out. But I think we've talked about this before. To me, the scariest words in scripture are, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. How many people are going to hear that awful sentence? And guess what? God will be just as he delivers that sentence. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the most important things bringing it back to the family is that when you go through the Bible with your children and, and do more than just Bible studies, actually go through the Bible and stop at the difficult parts. Stop right. where whole groups of people were wiped out because God judged them, mm -hmm. right? And then explain to them that God's goodness never goes away. Our sin goes away when we embrace God's goodness and when we're saved by means of the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So all the more reason for those who are already homeschooling, and I'm assuming that there's a lot or most of the people who watch this are, keep the course because what you're doing is important. Not only is it important for society, but it's important for your children's future. And don't be guilty of stealing their future. Exactly. Exactly. We have been given a great responsibility. I do pray that we would be found faithful in, um, in administering our duty before the Lord to our children and representing him well to the generation um, in which we live and to um, declare his faithfulness to the next ones. Andrea, tell us again the book that um, you recommended earlier, Larceny in the Heart. Oh, Larceny in the Heart. You can get that at calcedon.edu. And it goes into the various forms that societally, personally, we can be stealing. And maybe we'll discover like I did when I first read it. Oh, wow. I had no idea that's what I was doing. But mm -hmm. the thing is, when the light goes on and God turns on that light, then we're compelled to be obedient. Right. Let him who has stole steal no more. And let he who has ears, let him hear. Amen. That's right. We were reading this morning with our grandchildren that it's not enough just to hear. We have to be doers of the word. So let us be, uh, let's be doing that. All right. Well, I see our clock says we are done for this week. I'm looking forward to next week. As yep. always, it's a pleasure. All right. Till next time, everyone.